Hello and welcome to PFF Fantasy Football Podcast. I'm your host, Ian Harditz, and today we continue our Fantasy Files series with a look at some of the biggest risers and fallers in ADP from 2020 to 2021. Basically what I did, you know, using Fantasy Football Calculator, they have historical ADP trends. I looked at who was ranked really high in 2020 and who accordingly has risen or fallen in 2021. Obviously, a lot of these guys, Kenyon Drake, James Conner, very clear reasons for them falling. But ideally... And spoiler alert, I did. Uh, we can uncover some guys that have been, you know, falling for no reason, or maybe the public is overreacting to success, and we should be fading some of these risers. So, as uh, you know, one of my top ten tips for your fantasy drafts were, or as I stated, um, you know, we want to buy players closer to their floor than their ceiling. And you know, one big principle of uh, DFS, if you're out there on the DraftKings FanDuel streets, is that when we see guys, you know, dropping by thousands of dollars uh, week after week, sometimes you can look at that. DFS decrease a little bit closer and realize that, you know, the factors going into it aren't always, um, they're being overweight or underweight uh, relative to what they actually should be. So with all that said, going to go through quarterback, running back, wide receiver, tight end, highlight some of the guys that have just seen massive changes to their ADP and if it is warranted. Starting off at quarterback, we got Josh Allen, 2020 ADP, QB 11, 2021 ADP as the QB2. I think it's fine because with Josh Allen, people were hesitant to get behind him last year because he wasn't a great real-life quarterback yet. He's always been great in fantasy, though. In 2018, when he returned from injury in weeks 12 through 17, the overall QB1. In 2019, the overall QB6. In 2020, the overall QB1. While I do have Lamar Jackson as my QB2, I think you'd be hard-pressed to rank more than two quarterbacks ahead of Josh Allen in the year 2021. The featured faller is actually Matt Ryan, 2020 ADP, QB8, 2021, QB14. He wasn't bad last year. Like He finished as the fantasy QB12, QB15 in fantasy points per game. Still an upside QB2. The problem, people, what's going to happen without Julio Jones? Because when Julio was limited or sidelined last year, and that's just fewer than 50% of the offensive snaps, it was nothing short of brutal. These are just the passing yardage marks in those games. 238 yards, 285, 226, 232, 185, 224, 356, 300, and 265. Those latter three performances marked the only times he threw multiple touchdowns. And, you know, if you have been listening to these fantasy files throughout the summer, one of the studies I did earlier was looking at quarterbacks and their performance without their number one wide receivers. Now, I found quickly there are so few examples of quarterbacks having these applicable splits on both sides. Like, we don't have more than a handful of games for really anybody. Baker and OBJ, Mahomes and Tyreek, they barely qualified. And looking at Matt Ryan and Julio, it actually was the one instance where we had 25 games of Matt Ryan without Julio. And unlike Mahomes and Baker, who were inexplicably both better without their number one wide receivers, which we can chalk up to a small sample size, Matt Ryan was significantly worse. Without Julio Jones over the years, he has a 74.6 PFF passing grade. With Julio, 94.5. 7.8 yards per attempt with Julio, 7 without. 4.8% big time throw rate with Julio, 3.3% without. I know this offense isn't devoid of talent. Calvin Ridley is a great A baller. Kyle Pitts looks like the next big thing at tight end, wide receiver, whatever the hell they're going to use him as. Still, though, Julio Jones, special player. And with all this evidence of Matt Ryan slipping, he is someone that I'm comfortable continuing to fade despite his uh, you know, drop in ADP. I have him as my QB 19. I'm taking the rookies, Kirk Cousins, Baker Mayfield, Matthew Stafford, all those guys ahead of him. Some honorable mention notes. Russell Wilson with a four-point uh, four spot drop. Ben Rossberger, five-spot drop. Cam Newton, 11-spot drop. I mean, I guess Russ is the one that I'm not really buying as much, and he would still be, he is still my QB6 overall. And some of the strides we've heard from the Seahawks in the offseason, increasing the tempo, increasing their amount of passes in the intermediate areas of the field, all good signs for Russ. Uh, Justin Herbert and Jalen Hurts weren't ranked last year, now finding themselves in the top 12 options. And then we have Joe Burrow with a plus-four spot leap and Ryan Tannehill with a plus nine spot leap. So those guys are some of our other key risers at the position. You know, with Tannehill, some people are concerned about the loss of Arthur Smith, which is fair. Ultimately, I think the bigger news is they added Julio freaking Jones and the defense still looks awfully mediocre on paper. So I know Tannehill doesn't have the most volume in the world. How could you when you're giving the rock to Derrick Henry as much as he is? But I'm not going to say that, you know, this offense is going to look mightily different just because Arthur Smith 
uh, Arthur Smith took his talents to Atlanta. And then as for Burrow increasing, that's probably going to decrease because get this, people, Joe Burrow had a bad training camp practice. So keep that in mind. And I guess, you know, be like the rest of Twitter and just fade all the Bengals based on one practice. Couldn't be me, though. Moving on to running back, David Montgomery is our featured riser in 2020. ADP as the RB29, 2021 as the RB16. I think he's being priced about where he should be. The question is, will Tariq Cohen or Damian Williams be a legit RB2? Because when the season started last year, it was not looking good for David Montgomery. He didn't even clear 60% of the offensive snaps in the first three games because Tariq Cohen was out there a ton. Now, after Tariq got hurt, we saw Montgomery become a workhorse, particularly in the receiving game. I mean, if you just look at what he was able to do last year, only Kamara, J.D. McKissick, Naeem Hines, and Chase Edmonds scored more PPR points from purely receiving production than Dave Montgomery. He can be an RB2 just as the bell cow early down back, but the reason why he was an RB1 during the second half of the year was that receiving production. So Damian Williams, as my occasional co-host Andrew Erickson pointed out, hey, one of the best things he did in Kansas City was his excellence on wheel routes and in the passing game with screens. He's a far more polished running back than my guy Cordero Patterson was, who the Bears just ultimately viewed as more of a gadget than a legit RB2. I believe Damian Williams is going to be pretty involved if Tariq Cohen is going to miss time like he seems to be on pace for. For those who don't know, Tariq is still dealing with some stiffness uh, going on at OTAs and hasn't been off the pup list just yet. At the same time, though, money talks, and Tariq Cohen is the league's 10th highest paid running back for some strange reason in terms of total contract value. I don't get it either. Just realize it's not only Tariq Cohen potentially coming back. It's also Damian Williams who could, and it's why David Montgomery is ranked as the RB16 as opposed to a legit top 10 option at the position as he was down the stretch last year. Our featured follower is Josh Jacobs, 2020 ADP, RB8, 2021, down to RB19. Personally, I have him even lower in the old fantasy ranks. I have him as my RB28 behind guys like Raheem Mostert, Miles Gaskin, Chase Edmonds. The problem is that, first of all, this is PFF's 25th ranked offensive line. And what I say a lot, not to worry about offensive lines, but for guys like Jacobs, they do matter a little bit more because we're not getting the pass game, pass game work. It was already hard enough with Jalen Richard, DeAndre Washington, Devontae Booker. For some reason, these guys were making it hard for uh, Jacobs to get targets, even though he's generally made good use of them. And now Kenyon Drake's here, and John Gruden can't go more than a day, seemingly, without hyping up his ability in the passing game as well. So... With Nick Chubb, Jonathan Taylor, we're talking about PFS top two offensive lines. We can live with a little bit less work in the passing game. These other guys, I'm not so sure Josh Jacobs has that same sort of ability to score double-digit touchdowns or dominate on the ground like those other players. So we'll see. Josh Jacobs, you know, don't hate the player. Hate the ADP, and he is going awfully cheap. Top 20, though, is still a little bit steep for me. I would need to see him fall outside of the top 24 RBs before I'm willing to part with a pick. Right now, he's just kind of in that you know, even past the dead zone for me, uh, I have not got him in a single draft and I'm not really planning on it to tell you the truth. Some honorable mention notes, more guys that weren't even ranked last year and now are Miles Gaskin, Mike Davis, and James Robinson, each tentatively locked in as their team starter. I would chill out on the James Robinson hype a little bit, people. I know he's been the lead back in Jaguars practice. Guess who was the starting quarterback in the most recent Jaguars practice? Gardner Minshew. Trevor Lawrence was working with the second team, so I'm not going to put a ton of stock into what the Jaguars beat reporters are telling us in terms of pecking order at this moment. Travis Etienne still a first-round running back, and Carlos Hyde is not going away either. I do think Gaskin and Davis, though, we can warm up to a little bit more as we see them further cement their starting jobs in far less crowded backfields. Uh, some of the top risers, Nick Chubb, Aaron Jones, each had seven-spot jumps from last year. Jonathan Taylor, DeAndre Swift are up plus eight and plus 12. J.K. Dobbins, Antonio Gibson. As you can probably tell, rookies tend to be underpriced. And it brings up a good point where in, in terms of overall redraft strategy, if you're in one of these leagues and I get a ton of keeper questions on Twitter, feel free to send them to me. I'm happy to help out. Always down to talk ball. When you're looking at later round picks, like drafting these rookies, I just think makes a ton of sense because if you can get, you know, even like your Josh Palmer's, your Diami Browns of the world, you know, your Michael Carter's, your Trey Sermon's, 
they're priced so cheap right now, and if things just go their way over the offseason, you're getting them at an affordable spot already, and they have the potential to be top 12, top 15 guys next year where all of a sudden they are no-brainer fancy assets. In my favorite league, my uh, – Okay, it's a pretty pathetic eight-team league. I get it. Make fun of me if you want. But with all my college buddies, like my keeper is Antonio Gibson in round freaking 15. And this was before they cut Adrian Peterson, so it wasn't clear. But it was still like, okay, who else am I taking in round 15? Why not snag a uh, you know top three-round running back with the potential down the road to be something more? So I would just say, in general, when you get in the later rounds of drafts, if you can find a rookie with that top three-round upside and you have keepers enabled, uh, I think you'll... A lot of times see those players age like fine wine uh, in relatively short order. Uh, some big fallers, Miles Sanders down 10 spots, Clyde edwards alaire down 8, David Johnson down 19, James Conner down 24, Ken and Drake down 28 spots. Drake's someone I'm actually fine buying where he is. He falls in that flex with benefits tier. Uh, obviously, he's going to need you know Jacobs to not be as involved as he was in past years. Seems to be trending that way, though. I mean, they gave Drake a hell of a lot of money to, uh, you know, to be someone I think a going to be fairly consistently involved in this offense at a minimum I'm fine taking Drake you know outside the top 40 where you can see him going at times Clyde Edwards Alaire stands out as the guy that's falling a lot even though the situation is far better than what we saw for the bulk of last season I understand it didn't work out for those of you that drafted him as a legit top five back you don't have to anymore. He's my RB14. I'm happy to get him inside of the top three rounds. Uh, Todd Gurley and Le'Veon Bell, still without teams, unranked after being up there last year. Life sure comes at you fast as an NFL running back. Additional runners with a rather stark decrease in ADP. Melvin Gordon down 10 spots. Leonard Fournette down 13. Devin Singletary down 18. And Mark Ingram down 34. I would just note real quick, Unfortunately, my favorite late round running back, Zach Moss, is already dealing with a hamstring injury. I hate it. Please, God, turn off injuries. I turn off injuries in NCAA 14. I don't know how any, you know, non monster couldn't. With that said, I don't think Moss being out is a sign that you should be all in on Devin Singletary. We've seen how the Bills view Singletary, and that is if they need to start him and keep him on the field, they're going to have Josh Allen throw the ball 40, 50 times. And if they want to use their running backs, they're going to elevate Matt Breida and split things up more. Singletary really had his chance as a rookie, and he's not terrible, but we saw last year. It was Singletary and Moss, and when Moss went out, TJ Yeldon came in, replaced Moss essentially, and still made it a two-back committee. The same thing happened the previous year, but when Frank Gore uh, missed a game with a concussion. So, unfortunately, you know, Devin Singletary, even though he's slippery, like you look up kind of the, some of the leaders and miss forced tackles per carry, and you see Singletary's name popping up there, I just don't think the Bills view him as a three-down back, and ultimately, that's all that matters. Over at wide receiver, featured riser, Stefan Diggs, 2020 ADP, wide receiver 27. 2021, he's all the way up there as wide receiver three. Look, he got there with more volume than just about anyone, and we don't really expect that to be going anywhere. One of the most talented players at the position, Stefan Diggs, certainly deserves to be. Fantasy's wide receiver three and, and any you know short list of the league's very best receivers. Our featured follower is Kenny Galladay, 2020 ADP, wide receiver seven, 2021 as the wide receiver 29. It's unfortunate what Galladay's had to go through now with the hamstring injury, you know, being, it's not too unfortunate, I guess, that dude got paid to go uh, now live up in New York. But Daniel Jones, Jason Garrett, the hamstring, Kadarius Tony in the picture, Shepard Ingram, Saquon. A lot of mouths to feed, and he no longer has Matthew Stafford throwing him the football. So while Galladay at wide receiver 29 is fine, and if he keeps falling because of the injury, I guess I'll be okay with it. Certainly not someone I'd be willing to part with a top 20 pick for. He has kind of started to slide down the ranks more and more, and I'm getting more behind him. If he's going as a wide receiver three, okay, we're talking about one of the best contested catch guys in the league. Someone that we saw, you know, for large portions of the 2019 season, particularly with Stafford under center, really take over. There is a scenario where Daniel Jones looks more like the guy we saw in 2019 compared to 2020, and if that's the case, Kenny Galladay looks like a bargain at this ADP. I mean, it wasn't a trade like Diggs, but in terms of you know players changing teams, Galladay does kind of add up as someone that is similar to Diggs in terms of what we could be expecting. Personally, I'm more on Odo Beckham Jr. as the late 20s wide receiver that could flirt with legit top five value, but Kenny Galladay you know, could at least be the poor man's version of that. 
All right, under honorable mention, notable receivers that didn't have a high enough ADP last year to qualify for this list. Chase Claypool, T. Higgins, Antonio Brown, LaVisca Chenault, Russell Gage, Darno Mooney, Corey Davis, and Cole Beasley. People, draft Cole Beasley where he's going right now. It's ridiculous. Like, we've even gotten reports out of training camp that the dude is tearing it up. You know why? Because Cole Beasley is one of the best slot receivers in the NFL. And I understand his actions over the past, you know, three, four months. We haven't been talking about his ability on the football field. I'm just saying, I at this point, non-football factors are causing Beasley to be going outside the top 50 wide receivers in a lot of these drafts. And we're looking at a guy who has been Josh Allen's, Josh freaking Allen's number two wide receiver with over 100 targets in back-to-back -back years. And don't tell me that like you don't want high upside guys like Cole Beasley. He had five games with over 100 receiving yards last year. Do you want to know the entire list of receivers with more 100-yard games than Beasley last year? Well, if you don't, I'm going to tell you anyway. Travis Kelsey, Calvin Ridley, Devontae Adams, Stephon Diggs, DeAndre Hopkins, Justin Jefferson. That's it. Those are your guys with more upside than small white slot receiver Cole Beasley. He's someone that I continue to get at the end of drafts, and I am happy to do so. On the other side of the coin, we got Jalen Rager, Darius Slayton, Christian Kirk, and Sterling Shepard no longer boasting a trackable ADP after having one last offseason. We have Michael Thomas with a 20-spot drop-off, obviously due to his ankle injury. Yeah, I'm, I'm not drafting Michael Thomas before round like 14, 15. I just think this whole situation is trending towards... I don't want to say the guy's not going to play all year, but would it really surprise you? I mean, if it was gun to your head and it's Michael Thomas plays eight games or zero, I would probably be going with zero. Also have Julio Jones with 10 spot drop, Chris Goblin 12 spot drop, Thielen 10 spot drop, DJ Moore 11 spot drop, Odell Beckham with 14 um, down the ranks as well. I would say out of that group, Julio Jones has been someone that I've been happy to scoop up. Sometimes in round five in some of these fantasy drafts, I feel like I'm committing a crime every time I do so. Chris Goblin, don't forget people the amount of injuries he had to play through with the finger, with the concussion, all throughout last season, gutted it out. Could certainly see bigger things happening for him here moving forward. And I've obviously talked about OBJ enough on these podcasts. Uh, more players have experienced large drop-offs. DJ Chark down 13. Juju down 14. Gallup down 22. Marquise Brown down 36 spots. Ouch. T.Y. Hilton down 34. Devontae Parker down 36. And also A.J. Green down 36. I would just say that, you know, the first three in that group, DJ Chark, Juju Smith-Schuster and Michael Gallup, they're not in worse situations than last year. Maybe we kind of mistimed their, uh, you know, ability last year. I'm, like, they obviously weren't properly ranked last year, maybe other than Juju. But with that said, again, Chark, Juju, and Gallup, these are guys that, in Chark's case, has a better quarterback upgrade. Same thing in Gallup's case, considering he only got five games out of, uh, you know, Dak last year and Juju. I know he didn't get the long term deal from the Steelers, but there still isn't another offense in the league that we could project, project him for the amount of targets that we probably should be this year. So, Chark, Juju, and Gallup, I think, stand out as guys that have been falling for reasons not so much related to what we should expect in 2021. Also, finally, we're going to have some marquee risers Calvin Ridley up 11 spots, AJB up 10, Terry McLaurin up 12, DK Metcalf 13, Keenan Allen 14, Jerry Judy 15, Deontay. Johnson 17 and CD Lamb 27, but none of them even touched the biggest riser of them all. Justin Jefferson up 42 spots. You know, wasn't that long ago that people were talking about, and by people I mean training camp reports, Justin Jefferson not doing all that well. And we also can't forget that AJ Brown, T. Higgins, guys that were dealing with lower body injuries past August. Yes, I am telling you to draft Devontae Smith with reckless abandon and fantasy drafts of all shapes and sizes. We'll go round things out with a look at the tight ends. Featured riser, TJ Hawkinson, 2020 ADP, tight end 14, 2021, all the way up to tight end six. It makes sense. The last time we saw Matthew Stafford have one tight end to really run the passing game through, Tyler Higby put up some absolutely bonkers numbers. And I know I just said Matthew Stafford instead of Jared Goff. My bad. You get the point. There's nobody else to really throw the ball to in this offense. Hawkinson has draft capital. We know he is a good tight end in his own right. You guys maybe have watched. You've seen the Lions at least a few times on red zone. I think we all can agree Hawkinson is an above average talent. He is my tight end four. I'm taking him ahead of Kyle Pitts, ahead of Mark Andrews, just behind Kelsey, Kittle, and Waller. I haven't gotten much Hawkinson because usually I'm drawing the line before him, but I certainly think he deserves this rise in the ranks. Featured faller, Zach Ertz, 2020 ADP, tight end four, 2021, tight end 22. I'm not buying Ertz. Still, people, 
what are we expecting here? Dallas Goddard could win the job. I'm not buying Goddard either. Again, if you have two tight ends on your real life team, there's a good chance you have zero in fantasy football. And Ertz was so horrendous last year. I'm just not sure we should be expecting a big comeback from a guy that is turning 31 in November. I mean, do you really think the best years of Ertz's career are ahead of him at this point? I sure don't. Last year, he was PFF's 44th highest graded tight end among 49 qualified players, tied for 43rd in yards per out run, 47th in yards after the catch per reception, 46th in percentage of catchable passes caught. That's going to be a sheesh for me, ladies and gentlemen. Honorable mention. Got another handful of guys that were not ranked last year, but each now find themselves qualified. Robert Tunyon, Dallas Goddard, Logan Thomas, Irv Smith, Adam Troutman, and Gerald Everett. Adam Troutman will be my late-round tight end I'm targeting this year. On the other side, Hayden Hurst, Austin Hooper, Jack Doyle, and Chris Herndon. Payne have fallen out of the ranks out of that group. I would say Austin Hooper is the one that we should be looking at as, you know, why did he fall all that much? Should he have been ranked as the tight end 13 going into last year in ADP? Nope. Should he be outside the rankings this year? No. So I understand in redraft leagues, you're not touching Hooper, but tight end premium where he's going outside the top 20, I think Hooper is a value there. Some major followers. We got Gronk down eight spots. Evan Ingram down six. Jared Cook also down eight. The Gronk move is pretty surprising. We've gotten some word from Bruce Arians that OJ Howard is not nearing a return from that Achilles injury. So Gronk, I mean, he just scored two touchdowns in the freaking Super Bowl. I understand he's not the same guy that, you know, we saw in past years, but he's still someone that has Tom Brady as his quarterback and sure looks like one of the featured red zone weapons as a tight end 14. Now, I certainly think you could do a lot worse than having Gronk as your tight end. And two. And finally, the risers, not big, but Darren Waller is up three spots. Noah Fant up three spots as well. Hopefully Waller gets healthy. He has not been practicing for a while after, you know, really just going on the tear of all tears down the stretch uh, run of last year. Noah Fant, someone that I think we could see boom uh, this year if he can stay a little bit healthier. He only missed one game last year, but believe me, if you were looking at those injury reports, it was always something slowing him down. And when we saw him as a rookie, one of the better yak monsters we have seen at the position in quite some time. That's going to wrap up this edition of the PFF Fantasy Football Podcast, everybody. But first, I just wanted to say, you know it. Fantasy football season is here, and no one can prepare you better for your draft than PFF. For just $9.99, get access to PFF's Fantasy Football Draft Guide, player rankings and projections, all of PFF's locked article content, cheat sheets for your fantasy draft, and more. Again, that's PFF's Fantasy Suite for just $9.99. Draft smarter than your league mates this season. Thank you, as always, for tuning in to PFF Fantasy Football Podcast. New episodes every single day of the week. Hope you guys ever join the, uh, you know, the YouTube crowd out there. We got the cool studio behind me now. I actually just found... I'm finding new cool stuff all the time, but a minor league baseball card from, you know, PFF Steve. Connecticut... Uh, Connecticut Defenders, gotta love it. Steve in, uh, you know, 2007 went seven and four with a 214 ERA. Always finding new cool stuff at the PFF studio. Got some random ass helmets on the table, too. I love it. I love all you listeners as well, and we'll continue to grind out content throughout the season. So thanks for tuning in. And until next time, take care, everybody.